Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Wickoff Group, Genova Burns, Jean Tomasi Webster, Greenberg Trorick. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, HAP Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, Urban American, and These Friends. The 1700s, the, these people, the Harberts come over, then they go to Denver, okay, they, they had a plantation, Denver, Colorado, Stockton, California, then the kid is born, okay, you know, he's living in Queens, then he goes to Columbia, then he decides, hmm, let me see, maybe I'll go to Stockton, then he comes back to be a board of education, a teacher. Hey, I want to get a degree. I don't want to have one degree. I want to have three degrees. MTA? What did he know about real estate at the MTA? And today, he's the CEO for Collier's International New York, my good friend Joe Harbert. Hello, Michael. So tell me the story about the 1700s, the late 1700s, right? It's the late 1700s. Who comes over? The Herberts, not the Harberts. The they Herbert. decided to change their name when they got here. Oh, I didn't know. So they were the Herberts. Yes, they, they were the, Scott. They were Scottish. They're Scottish. So they yeah. came over. They came over and they settled they in the Carol. They stayed in the Carolinas. Apparently, they had farms and plantations. And then something happened in the 1800s. I guess it was the Civil War, and people started branching off. Some went to Atlanta. Some went to Chicago, and some went out west to Boulder. Now, in Boulder, what did they do over there? I mean, going for bisons or farming over no, there? No, no, they, be, they became affiliated with the School for the Deaf and were very involved with uh, its growth over the years. How did they then move to Stockton, California? Go west, young man. You know, something happened and people decided that California looked like the golden country and a branch of the family moved out there and that was, that was my grandfather. So your grandfather goes out to Stockton and what does he do in Stockton? He's a cop. He's a cop. He's with the police department, correct. Let's go to mom's side. Mom's side is the Italian side. That's correct. Mom's they side came is, from Sicily, right? They came from Sicily. My grandfather, pure Sicilian, and uh, we still know that family over there. Your grandfather, was he the stowaway? Uh, I had two grandfathers. One was a legitimate uh, uh, person on a boat, and the other one was an Ill illegitimate stowaway. So my grandfather, uh, uh, he came through uh, Ellis Island. And my, my great-grandfather on, on mom's side came through uh, New York Harbor where he jumped ship. And what they, what he do when he originally came over? He was just, he was a laborer on the east side. And the other grandfather was uh, involved, he became a pharmacist. He became a pharmacist. He, he, he said he was a little short guy, right? He was a little short guy, yes, and my mother ended up being a little short woman, four foot eleven. Uh, my grandfather, who we called Pops, 
uh, came over, put himself through school, uh, went to Fordham, became a pharmacist, and also was an entrepreneur and established generic uh, drugs in the early 50s. Now, let's say, now you ha your father, he's the son of a cop. How does he get into the Merchant Marines? He, well, it was wartime. And, uh, you know, he had worked as an intern at the FBI and decided that he needed to serve his country. He went to Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy, graduated with a degree in engineering, and they put him on a boat. Now, did they put him on the boat before the, your, your parents were married or after? Oh, no, he was on the boat before they were married, yes. We have that picture of your, your parents uh, under the sword. Up yeah, there. they got married at Kings Point Merchant Marine Academy, full uniform, full dress, under the swords. Uh, and from what we can tell, they were madly in love. So how did the Scottish uh, side, your dad, meet the Sicilian side, you know, SS, <laughs> over there, the Sicilian side mother? I think it was wartime, and uh, they just, uh, they socialized, and they met each other, I think, probably at a restaurant or a bar. You, they come back, and they settle in Queens, you were saying? Yes, Bayside. And you were born... Um, Baby boomer, one of, probably one of the you were first. One of the first baby boomers born. You were born in Flushing, if I remember. That's the correct. Hosp Flushing Hospital. But you lived in Corona. I uh, lived in Bayside. Bayside at that point. originally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about growing up in Bayside. How do you like it? Bayside was great. It was safe. Um, you know, uh, you could go out in the street and go out at eight o'clock in the morning and come home if you were hungry. But you definitely came home around six o'clock at night so you could eat dinner. So your parents never knew where you were. Now, during this period of time, your father was on the Merchant Marine. Yes. And you said to me he was involved even with the, the Cubans. Uh, yes. The, after the war, when, the, merch, when he, the Merchant Marine, the need for Merchant Marine was, was over as part of the war effort, uh, he worked for the Stevenson Lines Shipping Company, and he delivered the mail from New York to Cuba once a week. There was a Cuba the, mail line. But there was also the rum. <laughs> the, the rum was on the way back. Uh. And then uh, my parents got divorced. My dad uh, continued with the Merchant Marine. That was his career. And your mother uh, meets the fireman. My mother meets the fireman but restaurateur. The fireman restaurateur, as you said to me, you know, it, it was a good vocation because I think it relates later on when you work at Columbia at Baker Field, which I'll, I'll talk about <laughs> in a little while. But your father, your stepfather was the fireman. Uh, and he also owns a restaurant in Corona at this With time. With his brothers, yes, Jante's Restaurant. It was the closest restaurant to Shea Stadium. And besides the fact that it was a restaurant, it was also a catering hall yes, in the it back. Was. And in the catering hall, and young little Harbert over there was able to push the, uh, the rolling bar? The rolling bar, yes. That's now, how did, I made money on the weekends. Now, did you know how to make the drinks, or was it simple? Or you uh, just had to roll it? It didn't matter, really, to, because once you got the first drink down pat, they didn't care what came second. So I also used to park cars in the parking lot. I was the, uh, the guy who had to guard the parking lot so that the patrons could eat dinner because everybody who wanted to go to Shea Stadium wanted to park for free. Now, what happens after that is, uh, as in many cases, uh, people who are baby boomers moved out to Long Island. You moved out to Huntington, and in Huntington, uh, there were farms. They were potato farms. Potato uh, farms. This was a different place. I mean, from Queens, you're, you're going over here and you're in this very rural neighborhood. Yes, yeah, so there were four houses on our block and then there was the potato field. So we could see all of that going on. Sooner or later it became developed, but uh, it was a different life. You're in the suburbs. Cars matter. I had a mother who didn't drive. So you did a lot of walking. Now, you were a really good student. You, I was. You, 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 uh, you skipped a grade. I did. And if you stayed over here, you, that would have been SP. I don't know what. Yeah, it was seven to nine SP. That was the same idea out in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were growing up, uh, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? I always wanted to be an educated person. I thought that was important. I was always interested in politics and government. Not that I wanted to run for office, but I thought maybe I would be a professor. You graduate top. Of, cl of this class of 453? Top male in the class. The top male there were in the two class. So it was always the, two uh, women, the, the women who, who topped you over there. Yep. And then you decided you had three different colleges that you, ha that you were thinking of, right? Right, right. I thought that I, I was interested in uh, science. I liked science a lot. I wanted to do brain research. 
So I applied to the University of Rochester, and then back in the old days, we didn't do what college kids do now and apply all over the place. We had three things. You wanted the place you wanted to go, there was a safe school, and then there was something where you, you would so, apply. So Rochester, was that your safe school? No, Rochester was where I wanted to go. My safe school was Adelphi, and I, as a lark, I applied to Columbia. And I didn't you, think, you know, I didn't really want to go there. So you I, got accepted to And Columbia. I didn't get accepted at Rochester, and I got accepted at Columbia. So yeah. what was the choice? I had to go to Columbia. Now, he, this was culture shock for you. I mean, you were living out in Huntington, Long Island. You really were isolated. I mean, the only times that you re really got to the city was to work at the, the restaurant uh, over there. You're 16 years of age. You end up in Columbia. And what happens? Well, you know, I, I went to Columbia, and uh, I was 16 and uh, lived in the dorm one year. And uh, then you moved up to Washington Heights. I, I, well, there was a little brief stint in a condemned building, but we won't talk about that. Uh, so you, you moved yes, up to Washington Heights into an apartment with a, with a buddy of mine. Now, I think it was probably the skill of the rolling bar <laughs> that you were able to work at Bakersfield. Tell me about the hot dog. Oh, yes. Concession. Well, I, I decided I needed to work. I needed extra money. My dad was supporting me to, to, for the tuition and, and the, you know, the boarding. Uh, but I needed money, so I worked at the Baker Field selling hot dogs. And uh, there were a bunch of uh, freshmen selling hot dogs. I was the top salesman. So that's, there's my selling experience. And now you then get to, uh, you become a supervisor. I did. The second year I became a sophomore manager, where you made a little bit more money and you didn't have to go out in the stands and you just pushed other people around. So you're 18 years of age, you finish two years at Columbia, and then you say, I want a break? I want a break. Yeah, I wasn't into engineering. Everything was a required course. I wasn't, I wanted to do bioengineering and I was not, I didn't, hadn't taken a biology course yet. So there were not electives and I said, you know, I'm gonna take a break. So as they would say <coughs> in the trade, go west? Went west, I, I, well, there was another part of my family out there. You know, I had visited California a couple of times. I liked it, it was. Your beautiful. father at this time is working for General Foods. He had finished his, his career at uh, the Merchant Marine. Right. He's out there, and so I went out there, uh, lived with my grandma, and uh, I worked in a factory. You worked in a suspended ceiling factory. Absolutely right, yes. And, uh, we made learned... the grid pieces that hold the ceilings up even till today. Which was a great way because you work with all the people in the factory. You, you, you oh, it was great. Great experience. Great experience. I felt like I was a real person, that I was accomplishing something. I proved to myself I could work physical labor, and sooner or later they discovered that I could do engineering drawings. So they took me off the, the line. I was on assembly line. Now, from that, then how did you decide to go back to college or all of a sudden? I knew I was going to go back to college. The question was when. Uh, they used to call me the professor on the assembly line because I would work on a punch press, which you have to kind of hit this way, but I'd be reading books, and they were always worried that I was going to smash my thumbs. So, you know, about seven months later, I applied to San Francisco State College, and that's where I went. I love the story of how you met your first wife. I had a buddy on the, on the factory line with me. He was working for the summer. He said, hey, you're new to town. I said, yep. He said, well, what are you doing? Are you, what's your social life? I said, I don't have one yet. He said, I could fix that. Takes out his wallet. it has got about 30 pictures in there. He says, pick one. I said, are you kidding? He said, you know all these girls? He said, yeah, I know. Don't worry about it. I've gone out with all of them. Go down the list, pick, pick this girl. In a white dress. She, it was his prom date. Turns out that... Uh, I knew her. She was uh, someone who had thrown me in a pool when I was 11 years old. So on one, of, one of your trips out. On one to of Stockton. my trips out to Stockton because kids from the east we can't swim in pools. We only swim in the ocean. So it was a, it was a big deal. So um, that's the woman I picked out, and we ended up getting married. So now the political scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do now? Well, it's the Vietnam War, and uh, I wasn't I wasn't going to go to Vietnam one way or the other. So I was either going go so, to go so to you, Canada, go to jail, be a conscientious objector, or become, or, become, or become a, a teacher. Now, you had a couple of opportunities because the a deferment was available if you worked in a difficult neighborhood. Yes. There was an Urban Teacher Corps, which was a Ford Foundation NYU program. Um, they chose 100 of us, of us from around the country, and we got to go to Detroit, Chicago, or New York. So that was a pretty obvious choice for me. I came back I figured to you'd come back to the restaurant. You could be doing the rolling bar part. I did again. Well, that me. picture we have of you teaching on 128th Street in Harlem. Yeah, that's right. With that hat on, with that, a hat, that yeah. hat over there. And 
So, but it was a culture shock for the girl from Stockton. It who, was. And she goes to Hofstra. At she goes time. to Hofstra. It was big culture shock. You know, California girl, queen of the cow palace and equestrian. And here she is, you know, in New York. In Queens. In Queens with New Yorkers, you know, New York. Coronas. New Yorkers. New Yorkers. And so it was big culture shock. And uh, eventually, you know, we, we stayed married 10 years and she went back. Now, during this period of time, since you said before you wanted to have education, you go back for one of your first masters, right? Yes. Well, part of the Urban Teacher Corps program was a, a master's at NYU in education. So I got, I got that degree. I thought about doing the ED degree, you know, edu Doctor of Education, and I decided, no, it has to be a PhD. So I started all over again, went to City College, got a master's degree in political science. And then, and then I decided I was going to put my toe in the water because I always wanted to be an educated person, so I wanted a PhD. And then you get your PhD from the Graduate Center of yes. the University. Yes. Right. Now, during this time, you're teaching, but what happens? You had something, some involvement with the UN? I did. When, when I, part of the time when I came back, I worked for a group, a non-governmental organization called the Commission to Study the Organization of Peace. And we worked on the Law of the Sea Treaty. So I did that for a while, and then when I went back for the PhD, I got involved with the Ralph Bunch Institute on the United Nations. And they liked me enough. I was an intern. They made me the associate director of the institute. So that was partly how I made money. I got a stipend for doing that. I was going to graduate school. Uh, I became a substitute teacher at that point because the money was really good. They paid you about $100 a day to sub. And by then I had been teaching third, fourth, and fifth graders. So, so how do you meet uh, the legendary Frank Macchiarola? Ah, Frank Macchiarola was one of my professors at uh, the graduate school of City University. And we just used to hang out together and drink coffee. And then one day I woke up and he was chancellor of schools. And what does he do? He, he spoke in a quiet voice, right? Uh, Frank sounded a little like the Godfather. And, wh yeah. and what Frank said to you, kid? Hey, stay in school. Don't worry about it. I got this covered. And then I guess about nine months later, he called me up. His secretary did and said, uh, Frank would like to see you. The, the black car pulls up with, you know, the shaded windows. And, you know, it's almost like the Godfather. You got to get in, kiss the ring. But he was for the Board of Education. I didn't right. realize. So he says, Joey, I need you. I said, you told me to stay in school. He says, I know what I said, but it's only for a couple of years. Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll get your degree. He said, I'm bringing somebody in from Illinois, and he's got corn coming out of his ears. He's never going to make it here unless you help him. So, so I did. So what were you doing for Frank and the Board of Education? I was helping him run special education. And we're the, we're the group that opened the resource rooms. We were under court mandate at that point. Jose P. case, Public Law 94-142. The court was running special ed, and we had to report to the court. What do you mean the court was running special ed? You had a special master, and you had to go through all of your policies and procedures and programs with the special master. So now, master. are you, at this time, working as administrator or mm -hmm. as a teacher? No, I'm a totally administrator. Frank brought me in because he knew I had some teaching and experience. And at that time, simultaneously, you're still taking your graduate courses oh, yeah. for your PhD. That's correct. Now, so then Frank calls you a couple of years later, and what does Frank say now? The Godfather giveth, the Godfather taketh away. He said, Joey, the time's up. I said, what do you mean the time's up? Just like that? Yeah. He said, look, I'm not going to be in this job forever, and i got to start to place my people out there. Don't worry, you'll hear from us. I said, am I getting fired? He said, don't think of it that way. So I go off, and it's true. If somebody calls me and says, we have an interview for you. I said, okay. Go to the MTA. It's in the real estate department. Now, let's understand. MTA three masters, one PhD, doesn't sound appropriate. Well, it's a governmental entity, you know, PhDs in political science. There's a little connection there. Uh, you know, some people go in and out of government and academic So world, who do so you meet at the MTA? I meet a young lady named Marcy Boyle, who I knew from before. Uh, part oh, she worked for Frank too? She, uh, no, she, but she knew Frank from, uh, you know, Brooklyn Democratic politics. And so. what is Marcy? <laughs> Does she offer you a job that you can't turn down also? Yeah, the money was pretty good. And what was, what was the job? It was director of real estate and concessions for the New York City Transit Authority, in charge of pretzel stands, newsstands. Wait, you told me you were in charge of negotiating leases with pretzel stands, newsstands. And toilet agreements. And, and toilet agreements because you had to make sure that they were toilets for the bus drivers. That's correct. So that's, your, that's the initial. I quickly figured out how to give that to somebody else. But that was your initial job. Yes, that was my initial exposure to real estate. 
and then you then you got more you got higher up into the into oh, yeah. this into the role that you were negotiating leases with a major MTA with all yeah 500,000 foot leases we you know we, we we sold the Coliseum to Boston Properties we sold the Eastside Airlines terminal so what was your next job at the MTA what was the title of it uh, the title kept rising I was at the end of the day deputy director and when Marcy left I was a candidate for her job so let's talk about this now how many years were you at about the MTA? five and a half years yeah. so you're at the MTA you never became a real estate broker no 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 you, you were more of an administrator you were responsible I mean as you said selling the Coliseum, which was owned by the MTA mm -hmm. to Boston Properties. Retail Grand Central Terminal, I was in charge of that too. So, Advertising licenses, newsstands, poll pipe and wire agreements, you name it, we had it. I did that for then, and then I got this call on a Friday afternoon from a headhunter. And what the headhunter is saying? He said, I'm looking for somebody to run a canvassing program. And I said, I kind of know what canvassing is, but what does that mean? And he described it to me that people go around in buildings in New York, knock on doors and try to get meetings to talk about real estate. Now, listening to your background, I don't think you really ever canvassed a building. So you were supposed to hire people for the canvassing program? Hire people and manage them and make sure that they were canvassing properly. Yeah, but th at this time, it was the company was called Edward S. Gordon. It was Edward S. Gordon. Wh which was founded by the legendary Eddie Gordon, mm -hmm. who got into the business, I'm, uh, strange, because he, went to, he was in the Army Reserve as opposed to uh, teaching. And he met a guy named Lou Brous, Brous and that's right. uh, he was saying, "Hey, I got to go into this business." And Eddie was Mr. New York, because I was reading uh, an article yesterday that said when Eddie passed on, they they put the page, "Eddie, we love you, New York." You know, Eddie did that himself. He designed the paper, the page, and he bought the page in the Times himself, saying, "Thank you, New York, for a wonderful life." Yeah, I got to work with Ed Gordon. I I got that no, job. No, but we got to talk about how you got the job. So they they. They, they talked to you, uh, Eddie's people, um, Storch, what was his name? One of Sloan. The, yes. Sloan. 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 And what happens is um, they're offering you the job, but they hired someone else. Yes, they did. They did. They called me back and said, we, we hired a girl instead of you because that's how people talk then. And I, but she's an attorney. We figured we can get, you know, she can do brokerage agreements and this job. So, right. I mean, she, you know. she didn't have the degrees, you know, but she had a no, law degree. No, but she had, a, she had a law degree. And I said, okay. That's fine. Now, but you were up for the... I was up for the director's job at the MTA, which is a big job, but a political job. You know, you, you survive in those two or So three. you were up for the MTA job, and then on the 89th day, what happens? <laughs> in the 89th day, I get a call saying, uh, the girl didn't work out. You're still interested in the job. And Big Shot said, yeah, but it's going to cost you more money. And they said, how much? And I, I asked for another $10,000. And they said, okay. So, so what I got year, the job. So what year is this? Oh, we're about 18, 1987. So it's 1987. You really, your, I mean, your business involvement was really governmental or uh, truly governmental from education, from uh, the UN, from the Birch Society, all, all of this. And how was the culture shock to be involved with a New York real estate, commercial real estate brokerage? Well, it was pretty much a street broker shop at that time, so I thought after about two weeks that I had made a very terrible mistake. Um, I had people who would refuse to say hello to me because I wasn't going to be there very long. People who refused to learn my name because they didn't want to bother because I wasn't going to be there very long. So I had to make my way to prove my value as a manager. So you start as director of canvassing. That's right. And what happens next? Uh, I get every job that nobody else wants to do. When somebody leaves and they say, well, can you were in charge of the mailroom, weren't you? Yeah, I was. Uh, ended up in charge of the mailroom. That's how I knew when I had really arrived, when I got a call from Eddie Gordon saying, Joe, I'd like to send out a memo. Is it okay with you? So I had really gotten research, training, market meetings, canvassing programs. We were developing systems, computer systems at that point. So I had seven or eight things on my plate. and. Sooner or later, I guess they figured out I had some value. And, and then what, ha what happens later? Well, we, uh, we developed a managed brokerage approach towards the business, which you know, combined consulting and the sales management component, very much unlike what they did in other shops. And that was so successful that by 1995, we had overtaken Cushman and Wakefield in the marketplace. Now, by 1995, uh, at that time, the company was owned by Insignia? At that time, it was still owned by Eddie Gordon, and Ed Gordon decided that 
the, the world was too big, that he couldn't, he didn't have the capital to expand beyond Tri-State, and that he needed to be part of a bigger entity. He saw that trend well before what we see now, which is companies realizing that. So he sold to Insignia. So now... At, 1996. At, it's 1996, and at this time you were the chief operating officer of Edward S. Ward of Insignia. Right. In Insignia ESG. It was Insignia ESG, and then it was just Insignia. Yep. For, for the metro region. Tri-state, yeah. For the tri-state mm -hmm. region. So, you know, the, the world of brokerage is a very incestuous place, and everybody knows each other. So what happens? You're, you're there from 87, it's 96 over there, um, and it's like pinball game. You know, you know, it's like football. They trade. You know, one, mm -hmm. one day this guy's over here, one day this guy's over here. And, um, I mean, Cushman and Wakefield had uh, Steve Siegel. At one time, he was the chairman and president, and then he went over to Eddie S. Gordon, where you work with him. And what happens? You meet uh, this guy by the name of Mosler? I meet Mosler, yeah. Mosler's a great broker and a great friend. Um, and, uh, you know, I stayed at, I, I stayed at uh, Insignia at that point. We had a lot of fun. We went out and acquired companies. We were trying to build a national presence. So I got to do the M&A uh, thing for about uh, six or seven companies worth. And then around 2003, uh, Andrew Farkas decided it was time to sell, and he did. He sold to C.B. Richard Ellis. So I sat in the same place and was bought again. Um, I stayed there for another year, working with Mary Ann Tai, for whom I have great respect. Uh, but Mosler kept pursuing me to go to Cushman, and Mosler was about to be made the, the CEO. He was going to be the CEO of the entire company. Right. Worldwide CEO. And he uh, said, I need somebody to run New York for me. I think it's you. So... Um, I turned him down for a year, and then I finally said, you know what, it's time. Then what happens? It's 2012? It's 2000, well, it's 2004 then. I'm at Cushman eight years. It's very, a very good firm, great brand name. We're lodged in the number two spot in New York. Uh, we tried to figure out how to get ourselves up to number one, and we did. You know, we, we had a, a, a right, whole program. Right, but then you get a good opportunity to go to work for Collier's. Yeah, he, you know, uh, it's an uh, up-and-coming company, very well financed, and the opportunity was there for me to run a bigger platform, a bigger region. So I have the eastern region for Collier's. Tell me about your two sons. Their names ah, my and their two sons. Uh, uh, Joseph and James. Joseph calls himself Joe. Uh, Joe's 13. Uh, he's got really long hair, and he loves curve. animals. He loves animals. Well, and those aren't animals. Tarantulas, I think they are. Yes, they are. He's has, he has spiders. He's got all kinds of things. But and he's that's Joseph. It. And uh, James is 11, and uh, James is uh, finishing up uh, elementary school, and he's definitely a baseball pitcher. So I'd like to say, you know, probably in the, in the world of real estate brokerage, there are very few people who have the educational background. But more important than that, there aren't that many mentions and good friends like my friend Joe Harbert. Thanks for Feel being here. Feel the same today. way about you.